Um, we'll begin to report out sessions. I think that there were lots and lots of good questions and lots of opportunities to improve communication and to clarify communication about historic designation. We'd like to take three minutes per table to, um, to, to bring up your questions and comments, and then we will put those up on the board here. I can put some tape out and I'll get some more ready for you so that we can make sure to capture all of the information and all of the discussion this evening. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with table one, wherever table one is. All right. Would you like the microphone? Just read out your, your concerns and your questions. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Our questions are, are standards the same in every historic district and Will being in a historic district make property taxes go up? Yeah. Another question is what makes an area or district qualified for historic designation? And second, why would residents want to be designated historic and why wouldn't they? Uh, to what degree does a historic designation control the colors a property owner wants to paint his or her house? Table number two. I'm Gary Cox, uh, uh, Pershing Avenue in Mankey Park, and our to answer the first question, we have why is it necessary or why was it necessary to change the application process from a 51% to a 30% two years ago? The, another question is the concern, the necessity of going to the office for a COA. If 95 or 99% of the applications are approved, why can't the process be streamlined or use email versus going down to the office? Another one is uh, for our boundaries. Uh, it appears that the boundaries are being gerrymandered in affected areas rather than considering a whole neighborhood, like Minky Park. And then uh, another concern is uh, how long is it before an application can be submitted if the first one expires? If the two years go by, and there's not enough support for an application, does that mean that, say, if through the weekend someone uh, or enough changed their vote on Monday that they can su submit a new application? So shouldn't there be some downtime or dead time between applications? And then, of course, what was brought up here tonight strongly affects Mankey Park in the concern versus of uh, Reser uh, restorations versus preservation. Who decides the difference? We have a coffee shop going in on Davis Court that is a use of a property and the people use, uh, restored the house very nicely, but yet there's a lot of concern over the use of it going to be commercial in the neighborhood. <laughs> Table three. Table three, reporting. I currently have vinyl siding on my house. If it gets damaged, can I repair it or will I have to remove it? That's question number one. Question number two. If 51% of the area residents are opposed to being historic, will the process stop before going to HDRC, or can 
complete the process. Question three. If you want to paint your house the same color, do you need a certificate of appropriateness? Thank you. Great. Table four. Looks like there's a lot of opportunity to improve the communication, so that's good. Uh, table four, this is Roger Graff. I live on Clemson. Uh, question one, does the 99% uh, approval number that you have include resubmittals, i.e. the one that were sent back for revision the very first time? Uh, question two, can we speak to easy accessibility to city staff, uh, OHP, um, Will there be a specific neighborhood representative? What's the process for requests to be put in? And I guess uh, third, just because it came up on my end, was are there any numbers on resale being affected once uh, something falls under historical designation? Wow. <laughs> All right, this is table number five. Question number one, how much time does it take to have my project approved by OHP? Question number two, how did the opposition in Mankey Park arrive at the figure that my taxes will go up by 33% just because of historic designation. Question number three. What about people that don't like to be told what to do? <laughs> hey! Question number four. What can I do if I live next to someone that doesn't like to be told what to do? <laughs> Thank you. How does that process work? And what is actually what is the whole process to get the 30% to get everything going? The next question is how is UDC and Rio different from the historic designation? Because I believe we currently have the UDC and the Rio, and we're trying to figure out what the difference would be. And then our last question is is there a middle ground between the historical designation and the neighborhood conservation district? to show people who can't do it how to do it and how to make them as tight as a uh, as a uh, aluminum double window okay uh, also we are uh, we would ask for uh, consideration on whether or not metal roofs can be considered as part of, of what is appropriate for our neighborhood um, we also uh, talk just briefly about the you know what the basic problem is here what are people's individual rights and what are people's responsibilities to the community and to the neighborhood? So that's something that everybody has to answer for himself. Uh, also, we look, we want to know what are the extra burdens that we would have as a historic district over the neighborhood conservation district. Exactly one of the things that we have to do in addition to what we exactly have to do now. And also, we are, um, we wonder how 
the argument, the tenor of this argument got so poisonous, using words that are loaded like theft and sending paid employees out canvassing in the neighborhood and using ad hominem attacks on the radio against people and their positions and doing that anonymously. And we just want to see that it doesn't happen anymore. Thank you for that, and I'm going, but I am going to ask you to please keep your comments and your questions related to historic designation. Individual personalities of neighborhoods are just that, individual personalities, and, um, and there's, that's just the way it is. But please, if you would keep your comments on task, that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, our first question is: um, What are the lands? Any? What are the landscape restrictions under uh, historic designation? Other than like centuries, uh, if we heard things like you can't plant antiques without any, you know, permission. Um, seriously. Um, in addition to that, we're interested in knowing what the guidelines are for any kind of uh, sustainability technology such as solar or rain harvest that people might be interested in putting on to their homes. Um, and then we're concerned with uh, how we let people know, or maybe how you let people know that we already have code compliance for some some issues, so there are some rules already in place in terms of what you can and can't do on your property. And on top of that, we also have uh, the NCD guidelines as well. Um, so how do you get people to, to be aware of those restrictions already? Then the last one would be, um, are there uh, any standards of quality of materials for repairs or renovations? And this question is uh, the result of um, most of, well, we live on Queen Anne Court, and there's a house that's being redone right now at 402, and they're flipping it, and um, they're using very substandard materials. So our question is, is there something that you know, could be done or would be done under this sort of designation that would address that? <coughs> Thank you. So I what does historic do that the NCD cannot or does not do to protect the neighborhood? Half our table already that right away. How does historic add value for the homeowner? If I live in a bungalow and my neighbor tears down his bungalow and builds a multi-story mansion, what systems are currently in place to protect me from my neighbor? Are there any? Would historic designation help me? What are the requirements to be considered historic? If the city can't administrate NCD effectively, why bother adding another layer of city to my life? Yeah. How many people in Maggie applied for individual landmark status since the neighborhood historic application was submitted? Uh, let's see if I can read this one. If 99% of the 1,450 applications were approved, doesn't that mean that 1,435 applicants wasted their time? <laughs> I don't think people can add any fresh ideas. Uh, one question, what is the difference in interplay between the conservation district and the historical designation, which has been addressed several times? Uh, what additional restrictions are enforced concerning exterior changes and modifications solely by reason of historical designation? If the petition for historical designation can be changed, how do we ever reach a conclusion? Will historic designation prevent commercial or high-rise encroachment?
ladies and gentlemen. Uh, why should the city be able to control what I can do with my property? How do you know 51% of Nature Park residents are in favor of historic destination? Do we get a vote on it? Uh, referencing the current UDC code 35605, there is no vote, there is no 51%. If HDRC is rejecting 40% of the items that are out there on the registry, and you can go look at that agenda, how can it be 99% approval and why? That's table 11. Table 12 asks, what does the city gain if Mankey Park or any other district becomes historic? Why should the HDRC's members' opinions of what should or should not happen with a property carry more weight than the desires of the property's owner when the owner's desires are in line with City of San Antonio building and property maintenance standards? Who on city staff believes this methodology of historic designation is the best iteration of the ordinance to date? And how do I know if I'm in a historic district boundary already? Sorry, we put it all on one little thing, so here we go. Why did OHP staffer announce at an MPNA meeting that 3% in favor of historic made the process a done deal and no recourse for 50%? I mean, for 51%. For, uh, for I mean, Taylor's office, I stand correct. Also, wasn't 30% in favor of historic needed to make these informational meetings necessary or possible? Uh, is it true that there is a $500 fee, I added fine, that's me, I'm editing, if you don't get a certificate of appropriateness approval? What can neighbors do to protect their neighborhood if we do not have historic district status? Why is 50 years the average age to go historic? How can we get a rewrite of the ordinance affecting this process? What can be done to make the conservation district code compliance and the conservation district more efficient so we wouldn't need to go historic? Prior, in other words, are the other processes doing their job? What is the role of OHP in involving citizens in the entire process? Thank you. Oh, God, sorry, there's two on one. I didn't transfer those yet. I'll do that next. What are the benefits to homeowners going historic? And the other is, what is the demolition process? I think I'm getting some. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Where's the last table? tables are left? Sorry. Okay. Okay. A concern of ours is houses becoming neglected or vacant or dilapidated, etc., if not protected or preserved. Concern. I do not want my future home plans pigeonholed because a handful of neighbors have a distaste of new home styles. Why is there discrimination against landlords in Mickey Park? Why did the OHP say that once 30% has been achieved, it's basically a done deal? Can I change my duplex to a single family home in order under historic uh, designation? If dilapidated or unrepairable, uh, are we not able to demolish our home under historic district designation? Concern. 
lack of concrete answers for specific repair questions. Um, for example, asbestos removal and uh, windows, solar panel windows, or tin roofs. Concern, higher costs of repairs and upgrades under historic. What are the limitations to changing the landscape? If uh, they say there are not. Uh, okay, our two questions were: What are the fees associated with the uh, administration certificate of appropriateness, and can the OHP? Um, help research historicizing alternatives to fit your home, even if not designated, designated historic, and how, walk-in or appointment. I got you all the tables. Well, I must say I'm quite surprised that there's such a variety and not a lot of redundancy, so that, that's a great opportunity to improve that communication. While we take a two-minute break here to stretch, um, and if you want to take a look at these up here, we're going to continue to put them up. We just had to get Corey because he's a little bit taller. This is also an opportunity for anyone who has to leave early to um, make a uh, discreet exit. And then what we'll do is we will begin the open commentary and collect information um, as a group as a whole. So take a little stretch break. And uh, the restrooms are around the corner here. And then we'll reconvene in two or three minutes. All right, everyone that is staying, if I can have you be seated so that we can make sure to um, every, every, give an opportunity for everyone who wants to um, bring comments and questions up to the larger group. Um, the first thing I want to say, because there have been a number of questions, is what's going to happen to these questions? They will be um, input into the computer and then... OHP will respond to them and that will go on to their website. It won't happen by tomorrow, but it will happen um, as quickly as possible. And some of the questions that are up here are very easily answerable by the staff right now, so we thought with your permission we'll take an opportunity to do that and that will also go up on the website and then we will go to the public comments. Yes, sir. Could they make a mark on the ones they answered? Sure. Yeah, you know, a little green mark or something like that, so so we know which ones were open and which ones are not. Absolutely, no problem with that. So we're trying to remember. You know, we took note while you were speaking, and there were a few that. We definitely want to answer tonight, um, and so we're trying to find where they ended up. Hold the microphone closer. Sorry about that. Um, so if I live in a bungalow, my neighbor tears down his bungalow and builds a multi-story mansion. What systems occur for the place to protect me from my neighbor? Um, with the store designation, there are citywide store design guidelines that would be in place as part of the design review process. There is a specific chapter in those guidelines for new construction. Um, and in those guidelines, it does address things like scale and massing, and a lot of the, the bigger things that, that um, would restrict um, non-conforming uh, development within a, a, a more residential neighborhood. And so if you do have single-story single residences on a street, there are design controls that would limit um, the height and scale of, of new uh, houses being constructed. Um, second question, is it necessary to go to the office for a COA, which is a Certificate of Appropriateness? Um, and then if 99% is approved, why not use email or a streamlined process? And that's a very easy answer, we do use email. Um, the forms are downloadable on our website. Um, you can, it's a PDF format, you can fill it in. You can email it to ohp at sanantonio.gov and a planner will follow up within 24 hours. Um, if they can. If they have more questions, they'll contact you and let you know. 
but email is an option as well as people mail in their applications physically um, outside of actually coming down to the office. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Am I speaking too close to the mic? Okay, great. Um, I think Corey just answered a question about um, staff and, and how you can get a hold of us and how accessible we are. I just wanted to point out there was another question. Easy accessibility to city staff should be addressed, a specific neighborhood representative. And actually, we have something set up like that. Um, I'm not sure if you are familiar with all of our faces and our names, but we had a staff member leave us in June. And so um, prior to her departure, Corey and Sarah took all of our historic districts and divided them up. And they were the kind of neighborhood liaisons. Kind of, I joked around saying, you know, you guys are kind of the ear on the street, and, and you know what people are concerned about, and you know what uh, their questions are, and, and you're the same person that they can talk, contact whenever they have a question. So we're, we're going to continue that format. Um, uh, we'll be friendly staffed pretty soon. And uh, so you will have someone that your neighborhood can contact anytime. It's someone who will make an effort to distribute any kind of new information to you. So the answer is, yeah, we do have neighborhood representatives. And I want to go ahead and answer another question real quick that uh, was, can I change my duplex to a single family home in Hussor? Earlier we were talking about historic designation and how that is uh, it's part of the zoning process and it's an overlay zoning. And what that means is your base zoning is what determines the use of your property. And Kat's still in the room in case you have any technical questions. Tell me if I get it wrong, Kat. But your base zoning is what determines the use of the property. Single family residence, duplex, multifamily, commercial, industrial, and so on. Overlay does not affect that at all. So if your base zoning allows for you to